Today we're going to talk about something I think will be very important for us, and that is denying self to win to Christ. Denying self to win to Christ. Before we get started, I'd like to pray for us one more time. Lord Jesus, I thank you again for today, and I just pray that you would minister to us through your word, that you would help us to see your truth, that you would help us learn from the Apostle Paul, Lord, um, uh, principles, God, on how we can be most effective in reaching people for your name's sake, because that's what we desire to do. We desire your name, Lord Jesus, to be lifted high and magnified, God, through people trusting in you and giving you the glory that we deserve. So help us this morning, we pray, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we've been focusing on disciple uh, making. If you have a Bible, by the way, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. That's where we're going to be. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We've been focusing on disciple making, as we should, since it's the mission of the church. And if we want God's blessing upon our church, we have to be doing what God has commanded us to do. Right? We have to be about the master's business. All right, And so we don't get to decide what we do as a church. Jesus decides what his church does, and he sets the agenda for his church, and that agenda is glorifying his name because he's worthy, and the way that Jesus is most greatly glorified is by having more and more people find their joy and hope and meaning and gladness and satisfaction in him, seeing him for who he really is, and rendering him the praise and adoration that he is due. And this happens through disciple making, through proclaiming the gospel and seeing people come, seeing people be born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus commanded him, showing them just how great and glorifying and satisfying that Jesus is, and then repeating that over and over until Christ comes back. That's the mission. That's the, that's the purpose. And so we, we've, in recent weeks, we've talked about how to lead someone to Christ. If you've missed that sermon, it's, not complicated, it's not rocket science, but it's very important. I encourage you to go back and listen to that. Last week, we talked about the need for prayer and the primacy of prayer and the importance of prayer. God only blesses total dependence on Him. God's going to get all the glory for everything that happens, and we don't, we don't get a little bit of it. And the way that happens is by crying out to God to do what we can't do so that He gets all the glory. Now, today what we're going to talk about is a little bit of missiology. So missiology is simply a theology of missions, okay? So when we're trying to reach people for Christ, especially in missionary context, you're faced with all kinds of complex questions that come up. And there's been some serious debates in the world of missiology over the past couple hundred years about what is what you can do, what you shouldn't do in missions. But it's important to think through these issues because... We have to we have to think critically about how to lead other people to Jesus. We can't be superficial, right? We don't want to put unnecessarily unnecessary stumbling blocks in front of people, but at the same time, you don't want to water down the gospel either. And so, what we're going to look at today is some basic principles that Paul applied to himself in preaching the gospel that I think we can think about and will help us as we seek to reach other people for Jesus. And what we're going to see. Uh, the, the overarching principle we're going to see is that we must deny self to win to Christ. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, denying self to win to Christ. From 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 20. So if you have a Bible and you're able and willing, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 20. Paul says to the Jews, I became a Jew, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. Word of God, you may be seated. Okay, we're going to see three principles this morning. Missiological principles. Number one, to reach others, we deny freedoms. To reach others, we deny freedoms. Number two, to reach others, we embrace different. 
To reach others, we embrace different. And number three, we, we reach others to share blessings. We reach others to share blessings. First, number one, to reach others, we deny freedoms. To reach others, we deny freedoms. So don't forget that the great controversy in the early church was a missiological one. Okay? How should the gospel be proclaimed to Gentiles, to non-Jews, right? And what does it require of them? So the Jews constituted the Old Testament people of God, right? They received the promises that God chose Abraham. He didn't choose anyone else. He chose Abraham and said that through your offspring, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Almost the entire Old Testament deals specifically with one people, with one nation, the Jewish nation. They're the Old, they received the law. They're the Old Testament people of God. And so the great question in the early church was that how is it? How is it that a non-Jew could obtain access to the blessings and promises of God without becoming a Jew. That was a serious problem. That was the great question for the early church. Many of the early Jews, even Christian Jews, profoundly wrestled with this question. There is a party within the early church that Paul referred to as the circumcision party who actively taught that Gentiles first had to become Jews. Males had to be circumcised and they had to keep the Jewish law before they could truly become Christians or to faithfully follow Jesus. And so thank God that God, that he gave a vision to Peter one day of a sheet descending from heaven. And on that sheet was all kinds of unclean animals that the Jews were forbidden to eat and the voice from heaven, this is a good word right here, rise, Peter, kill and eat. You know, God tells you to eat, you eat, all right? Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And then, but Peter says, no, Lord, nothing unclean has ever entered my mouth. And so Peter is a faithful Jew. He's a devout Jew. Nothing unclean had ever entered his mouth. But then the voice said this, what God has declared clean, you don't call common. And then what happened at that moment? Men sent from Cornelius, a Gentile, knocked on the door. And Peter understood that God, by the vision and through the Spirit, was telling him that God is now calling Gentiles clean. And what God has called clean, you do not call uncommon. You do not call common. And so... It turns out then that through Jesus Christ, a Gentile doesn't have to become a Jew to be saved, but all people, Jews and Gentiles alike, are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And this was anticipated by Jesus himself, who said that it was it's not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles him, but what comes out of his mouth that defiles him, because your sin comes out of your speech. It's usually the first place it comes out. So the sin comes out of speech, and that's what really makes you unclean. And Mark, in Mark, when he shares this story, he he makes this editorial comment where he says, thus Jesus declared all foods clean. And so the early church understood, and Jesus himself understood, that, that he was, even though Jesus himself was a Jew, and even though Jesus himself kept the law, Jesus understood that his work, when it was fully accomplished, would essentially... It would essentially fulfill the Old Testament law so that it's no longer required of those who believe in him. And Jesus himself understood this and anticipated this. But of course, this was a hard pill to swallow for Jews who for millennia found their religious and cultural identity in keeping the law, right? We have cultures, we have traditions, and they're so deeply ingrained in our hearts and in our minds that sometimes it's hard to discern between breaking a tradition and sin. So sometimes someone does something that you're not used to and you just think it's flat out wrong when it's not even in the Bible. But it's so ingrained into you because of who you are that you just, it's, it's just, it's culturally, uh, it's, it's, it's just culturally, uh, you can't touch that, you can't go there, that you, 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 you feel that way. You feel, you have a strong inner revulsion. Well, this is how it was for the Jews, right? When you have been taught your whole life that eating clean food is an act of obedience to God, and that eating unclean food is an act of rebellion against God, you would have a hard time eating bacon post-resurrection too. You just would. 
And Paul, having received a revelation from Christ, having thought long and hard about these issues. He, he, he knows in Jesus that all foods are clean, that one does not have to keep the strictures of the Old Testament law to be saved. But what what does he mean then when he says to the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews? Well, at least one thing it means is this. It means that when he was trying to share Christ with the Jews, even though he did not have to keep the law, he kept it. If he was around a Jew, he would keep the Jewish laws. He would eat kosher food. He would keep the Sabbath. He would offer the sacrifices. Right? If, 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 if Paul was trying to share the gospel with a devout Jew and he was invited to a picnic, he wouldn't bring a BLT. He just wouldn't. Because the Jew would be so offended, so grossly offended by Paul's breaking of the law that they would no longer be able to hear anything else he has to say. And so what does Paul do? Even though Paul was legitimately free to eat whatever he wants and not keep the law, out of his Christian love and desire for people to come to know Jesus Christ, He denied himself legitimate freedoms so as not to give unnecessary offense to others. In a day when everyone, what what everyone wants to do today is demand their rights. Who are you to tell me I can't do this? Who are you to tell me I can't say that? Who are you to tell me I can't wear that? Who are you to tell me I can't go there, do this, or drink that, or eat that? And in a day when everyone wants to demand their rights, Paul does something, Paul teaches us something truly countercultural, and that is, out of love for people, we will willingly deny our own freedoms if it means they'll give the gospel a fair hearing. If eating meat or pork or whatever is going to be cause, become an offense or a stumbling block that gets in the way of someone giving the gospel a fair hearing, then Paul says, I won't do it. I'll become a vegan. Now that's a high price to pay. <laughs> that's called love for Jesus. Because you care more about their souls. And so we have to, we have to learn to think missiologically. We have lots of freedoms in Christ, thank God. But the law of love, the law of love will call us to deny our freedoms so as not to lay stumbling blocks in the way of others. So missiologically, right, this can mean lots of things. If dressing a certain kind of way gives people the wrong impression, then we should change the way we dress. All the great missionaries of the past, Hudson Taylor, Lottie Moon, when they went to China, they dressed like a Chinese person. Why? Because they didn't want to give the impression, because there's there's always, especially in missionary context, right? They didn't want to give the impression that to become a Christian means becoming like me, wearing Western clothes, right? And that's what a lot of people associate, right? People would think, people in China would say, well, that's a, that's a, that's an American religion. And that's what a lot of people think, or that's a Western religion. But when they dressed like a Chinese person, they said, well, wait a second. Maybe I can be Christian and still be Chinese. There's a novel idea. And so what they do, they change the way they dressed. You would be amazed at the number of people who have told me, I can't come to church because I don't have nice clothes to wear. It would blow your mind. Because they think, they think that the, that this is a prerequisite to hearing the priest's word and praising Jesus. That's a problem. Now, there's nothing wrong with dressing up nice, but when it becomes a stumbling block, let me tell you something. I'm pretty sure Jesus wore the same clothes in the synagogue that he wore everywhere else. Pretty sure. I wasn't planning on saying this, but I heard a preacher say this one time. He got done preaching a sermon. This man came up to him, stuck his finger right there. He was, he, he seemed to be upset, but the pastor wasn't sure. He said, everything done in church needs to glorify God. Yes, sir. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
Everything done in church needs to glorify God. Amen. Yes, sir. You're right. Young man. Everything done in church needs to glorify God. You cannot glorify God without a tie. And then the preacher said, well, I guess Jesus was out of luck. Because Jesus never wore a tie. We, 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 we cannot add to the gospel. We just preach the gospel. So we got to think missiologically, right? You know, some, some of these big TV preachers live in a million dollar home. Well, it's hard to preach the gospel to a poor person if you live in a million dollar home. So maybe you should sell the house, live simply, give more, and then you, you'll be more, you, you'll be able to share the gospel. We got to think missiologically. Because to reach others, we deny freedoms. To reach others, we deny freedoms. Number two, to reach others, we embrace different. To reach others, we embrace different. In 20, verse 21 there, Paul says, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God. That means it's not like he can't do whatever he wants, right? But he's under the law of Christ. But at the same time, he became as one outside the law that he might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all people that by all means... I might save some. So the flip side of denying freedoms, the flip side of denying freedoms is embracing different. To the Jews, Paul acted like a Jew and he kept, he kept, uh, he, he observed the Jewish law and would not give a necessary offense or be in a necessary stumbling block to those hearing the gospel. The reason for this is that the gospel is offensive enough. If you preach the gospel correctly, people are probably going to be offended because what does the gospel say? Repent of your sins, deny yourself, and follow me. That's pretty offensive. The gospel is offensive enough. And because of that, we don't have to add to the offense by saying you have to believe the gospel and do this other thing or be this other person as well. To the Jews, Paul became as a Jew, but to one outside the law, he became as one outside the law. What that means, of course, is that Around Jews, he acted like Jews. Around Gentiles, he acted like Gentiles. That doesn't mean he embraced sin, but it does mean that what was once a matter of moral responsibility to a Jew, keeping the law, right? In Christ, these matters that were so important to Jews have now become matters of indifference. Matters of indifference. So someone might, have Paul, might accuse Paul of being inconsistent, right? Acting one way around one group of people and one way around another. But that actually misses the whole point of what Paul's doing. Because the, well, the point of what Paul is doing is that, is that he's, he's trying to reach people for Christ. And in Christ, there are things that really just don't matter. It's just, there's, there's things that really just don't matter. You can, you can eat, bless God, pork chop, like I did last night. <laughs> To the glory of God, and you cannot eat a pork chop to the glory of God. Okay? You can wear a tie to the glory of God, you cannot wear a tie to the glory of God. There's all different things you can kind of do that's just a matter of indifference. It doesn't matter what you eat as long as you give thanks to God. It doesn't matter if you're circumcised or not, because Paul said either circumcision, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision needs matter, matters, but a new creation that is born, new birth by the Holy Spirit. That's what matters. It didn't matter if you keep the Sabbath or not. You could do all those things and worship Jesus. You could. You could be, you could be a devout Jew for the most part and worship Jesus and keep all your Jewish practices. But you didn't have to. So when Paul was around Gentiles, he embraced different. And I say different because, because different isn't right or wrong, it's different. And see, that's, that's where the rub comes, right? Because lots of times we think different is bad. And that, and the, the point, the thing is, it just depends. It might be bad, it might not. Sometimes different isn't better or worse, it's just different. Paul was a Jew. Paul was a Pharisee. Paul was part of the strictest sect of the Jews and the devout Jew, a devout Pharisee, right? If Peter, a fisherman from Galilee, said that nothing unclean had ever touched his mouth, do you think it was a problem for Paul the first time he ate with a Gentile? 
But what did Paul do? He taught himself to embrace different for the sake of the gospel. Now that's hard because almost certainly, without a doubt, they felt like they were giving up a part of themselves. Right? For a Jew who had been a Jew his whole life to begin eating non-kosher food, for example, they would literally be feel, feel like they're giving away their entire history, their entire past. Right? They were giving up a part of themselves. But they were faced with a, they were faced with a, a, a conflict though that had to be wrestled with and dealt with. And that is, if they were going to preach the gospel, how could they add to the gospel demands that God himself didn't? Who are they to demand more of people than God does? Who are we to demand more of people than God does? And so they learned, they taught themselves to embrace different. Paul ate different things. He spoke a different way. He didn't always keep the same schedule. He could have, but that would have put an unnecessary stumbling block in the way of Gentiles. Paul, remember, so we have Paul the Pharisee here, okay? And then, then they're in Antioch and Peter shows up. All right, and everyone's having a good time. They're all eating with Gentiles. Okay, they're having a good time. And then some guys from Jerusalem show up. The, the you know, so, some conservative fellas. And Peter says, oh boy. They're going to talk bad about me back home. Maybe I'll just kind of sneak away from the Gentile table. He feared man. He feared the opinions of men. And Paul, get this, Paul said, this, this seems like a small deal to us, but you gotta, you gotta give kudos to Paul. Paul said that Peter backing away from the table with Gentiles was a denial of the gospel. He said it was a denial of the gospel because it's implicitly telling the Gentiles that you're sub-Christian. Unless you're like me. Unless you're a Jew. And that's what Peter, that's what Paul told him in Galatians 2. When I saw their conduct, verse 14, was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you force Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves, Paul and Peter and them, are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So the burning question for us is that is where do we unwittingly add to the gospel? I don't think nobody, I don't think anybody does it intentionally. But we do do it, and we have to think about it. We have to think about cultural differences. Now, culture, cultures are not above critique. Just because something's a cultural difference doesn't mean, oh, well, that's just what they do. It's okay. I'm not saying culture is above critique. The Bible always critiques every culture. But at the same time, we have to do the hard work of thinking critically about what is a matter of indifference and what isn't. And, and then we have to apply those principles so that we're careful not to add to the gospel demands that God doesn't. You know, to make a controversial um, possibly point, church, uh, music is a good example, right? Churches are notorious for worship wars. But that's why it's so important to keep perspective. Did you know that there was a day when it was unthinkable for people to have to play the piano in church? Because piano was considered a bar instrument. You seen them old western? It was considered a bar instrument. I don't know a church that doesn't have a piano. But what is, what was that? It was a cultural thing. Right? Did you know that there was a day when they, when Amazing Grace was a new song? People had to learn it? Aren't you glad they did? And so, you know, Jesus didn't sing any of the songs we sing today because he didn't speak English. 
And so there are new songs that are bad, and there are old songs that are bad. Go flip through a hymn book. Read some of the songs. They're not all good. Some of them are bad. Old songs that are good, and there's new songs that are good. If we were preaching the gospel in Africa, I would say, let's write some gospel-centered, Christ-exalting new songs in your language so that you could praise God in your heart, in your mind, for you. Every generation has to be faithful for themselves to seek God. We can't live. I mean, we, we learn from traditions. We keep traditions. Traditions aren't necessarily bad, but at the same time, we can't, we can't fall in love with traditions to the exclusion of the gospel. We, and my point is that we should think missiologically, not just in Africa, but we should think missiologically right here in Dodge County. Why? Because 80% at least of the people in Dodge County are lost and going to hell. And if we can create a space that is worshipful, where the gospel is proclaimed, that removes unnecessary stumbling blocks for people to hear Jesus, that's what we need to do. And that means we might sometimes have to do and hear things that might not be our favorite. But I really believe this. If a Pharisee can learn to glorify Jesus eating a pork chop, I can learn to glorify Jesus singing a new song. Because we must deny ourselves to win to Christ. To reach others, we must embrace different. And sometimes different is just different. Paul, I imagine, Paul, he would have been more comfortable just hanging in Jerusalem, doing what he always done. But God called him to different. He didn't have a choice. Paul said, Paul said, even, he said, even if, essentially, he said, even if I don't want to preach the gospel, an obligation is placed on me. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. So we reach out, to reach others, we deny freedoms. Number two, to reach others, we embrace different. Number three, we reach others to share blessings. We reach others to share blessings. Verse 23. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. We must learn to think missiologically. We might not be missionary, strictly speaking. I do think it is important to maintain a... Not everybody is a missionary, strictly speaking. I think it's important to maintain the distinction that there is, there is a special call to cross-cultural missions. But we do have to learn to think missiologically. Why is that? Because the world, I don't know if you guys notice this, but the world is changing. Anybody notice that? The world is not like it was 50 years ago. The world is not like it was 10 years ago. If you don't know that, you're not paying attention. Now, I'm a millennial. Some people roll their eyes when they hear that. And that's okay. I don't mind. My security's in Christ, y'all. Millennials get a bad rap, but let me tell you something. Millennials lived in a, we, we all do. Every generation has its pros and cons. Everybody has their own things that their generation had to face and, and different things. Millennials had an interesting, and I think we can say unique experience. Why is that? Because millennials lived during the time of the invention of something that changed the world. Computers and the internet. We really do live in, in, the, in the smartphone, by the way. So they invented the computer, they invented the internet, and not only did they invent the internet, but now you can access the internet anywhere you are. Okay? These things changed the world. Now, you know, it, it really is true that we live in a unique time in history because, because of the technological revolution, right? Think about history. For most times in most places in the world, the, 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 the grandchildren, the great grandchildren lived the exact same way that their parents did, that their grandparents did, that their great great grandparents did. Eking out a living, trying not to die, subsistence farming, 
You know, whatever it is across the world, most people lived the same way that all the previous generations, but something really did happen within the last couple hundred years. The technological revolution happened. We have things now that have never existed before in the history of the world. Electricity, nuclear power, penicillin, TV, internet, access to information that was just un unforeseen ever in the history of the world. You know, the, the most powerful people in the world a thousand years ago didn't have air conditioning. The world is different. Paul lived in the dawning of a new spiritual era. And in a, in a different way, we live in a different era too. And Jesus said, Jesus warned the people in his day. He said, hey, look, I'm coming Something's going to change, and you can't put new wine in the old wineskins. But Jesus also said, but the people who've had the old say, I like the old better. The truth is, is that the old, the old world isn't coming back. It's just not. And even if it was, COVID changed all that. So there's no way it's coming back. And we have to face the reality, and this is scary, but the problem is that the church hasn't, we haven't been quick enough to adjust to what's happening right before our eyes. But the truth is, is that we have generation now that is more influenced by what they see on a screen being produced by people thousands of miles away. And they're being more influenced by that than by their own parents in their own household. Do you see what I'm saying? Are you tracking with me? You could have somebody raised in your own household and they're being more influenced by some person who, guess what? They have, a, they have their own agenda for your kids. And they are flooding their screens and their, mute and their earbuds with what they want your kid to know. And you have no, and you better start exercising some control over it if you haven't. We just live in a different world. And we got to learn to, we got to learn to adjust. We got to learn to work in it. We must become, because the world is different, we have to become missionaries in our own backyard. You know, Lottie Moon could have went to China and she, and she could have said, man, I'm tired of all these Chinese things. Just so aggravating. I don't like it. She could have said that or she could do what she actually did and said, I love these Chinese people and I'm going to reach them for Jesus. Right? And so here's what we could do. And, and, and yeah, I poke at millennials too. We can poke at, we can poke at millennials or, or Gen Z or whatever and say, you know, I don't, I don't like that right there. I don't like what they do. They got a bad attitude. And I can sit there and complain about their generation or I can try to win their generation for Jesus. So we got to decide what we're going to do. Paul says that he did this for the sake of the gospel. That he might share with them in its blessings. You see that? Paul saw that the gospel of Jesus Christ is like an inexhaustible fountain. The gospel can't run out of blessings. The more blessings that the gospel gives, the more that it has to give. When someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ, it's not like, oh, there's, there's one, there's a, there's a scoop out of the bucket. We're running out of blessing. That's not how it works. The more people who come to Jesus, the fuller the bucket gets. Jesus' gospel bucket is so full of blessings that the worst thing we could do is to not share it with other people. There's so many blessings to be had. And Paul went out there, and when he saw Gentiles, he saw, yes, he saw different. He saw pagan. He saw sexual morality. He saw all kinds of mess out there. And he said, he could have said, I ain't touching that mess with a 10-foot pole. But what he said was, 
I'm going to give them Jesus. Lost souls missing out on the blessing of the gospel. So if there is something that we can do that does not compromise the gospel, but helps make it easier for people to hear the gospel, we should do it. We should think missiologically. We should be missionaries in our own backyard. Because I really believe this. The re... I mean, there's lots of factors, of course. But let's just face reality. The world is better at speaking our children's language than we are. And that's part of the reason we're losing them. We're not learning their language. We're writing it off. We're saying it's problematic or it's part of the problem. And that may be so, but guess what? To reach somebody, you got to speak their language. So until... And the truth is, is when they turn on their screen, when they put in their earbuds, it might be totally different from what you want them to hear. But guess what? Somebody's speaking their language. We need to learn to think missiologically. We need to learn to speak people's language so that they can hear the gospel and believe it and be saved. Why? Because in the gospel, there's more than enough blessings to go around. Even if it means denying freedoms, even if it means embracing different, we can do it because Christ is with us and Christ is for us. And as I close this morning, this is this is the portrait that I want to leave you with. Jesus embraced different. Jesus denied self. Jesus came down from from heaven Worship by angels to be spit on by men. For you, and for you, and for you, and for you. He did it. He chose it. He chose it for us. We can choose it for others. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for... Your love for us, Lord Jesus. Thank you for being the first missionary who left your throne. As we sang about, you left your throne to get on a cross for us. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help us think missiologically. I pray that you would help us to look and see people as you see them. People who need you. And so I pray, God, that you would you would lead us. I pray that you would teach us. I pray that you would walk us down the path that you would have us to go. I pray that you would wield us, God, as a, as a church, an instrument, a tool in your hand. To see lost people, to see the next generation come to know you, Lord. Help us, Lord. We want to be used by you. We want to follow your example, Lord Jesus. That though you were rich, yet for our sake you became poor. That through your poverty we might become rich. And so I pray, Lord, that we would be willing to follow you. To deny self, to embrace different. To win others to Jesus Christ. It's not easy. It gets complex. It gets messy. But I pray that you would help us do it. Do it wisely and do it well. To share the blessings that are with the gospel, because God, there are so many. Help us share them for you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.